Hey everyone, we are back with uh, part two of this book called The Ten Year War by Jonathan Kahn. Um, and part two is about how the ACA came into being, the behind the scenes of it, and um, a really great part, an engaging part to read. I think I finished it within no time and I hope that y'all enjoy it too. So today uh, we have me, which is Nikita and Laura, and we'll be talking about a little bit of what we found in part two. So you can take it, Laura, from here. Oh, cool. Um, so the first thing that we wanted to sort of discuss was the more challenging, difficult conversation part of it, which was continued um, fear mongering and unfortunately racist rhetoric from mostly the Republican Party. We saw this with Grassley, who was definitely under fire um, for helping to advance socialized medicine. We had several threats from Mitch McConnell um, on oh that front. <laughs> um, <laughs> there was um, damage to public approval of the Obama plan um, when it came to the medical directives part from Zeke Emanuel, um, who created those. They ended up um, being referred to as death panels. Um, a rationing of care, euthanasia plans, um, the sick, um, disabled and elderly will suffer, a downright evil. Those were all quotes from the book. Um, we have rhetoric of Black people only supporting Democrats because they're dependent on the government programs. And with that um, comes this rhetoric that, you know, oh, public programs are for people who are hardworking and deserving and contributing to society versus um, like handouts, which are for undeserving freeloaders, et cetera. And another quote from the book um, was subsidizing losers mortgages, which was referring to a specific um, bill put forth by Obama's team. Um, and one representative called it a civil rights bill and reparations. And so it's kind of clear that race and racism were um, huge factors among Tea Party voters. Um, there was one quote, um, I'll just read it. Um, Rather than conscious, deliberate, and publicly expressed racism, these racial resentments form part of a nebulous fear about generational societal change. And just as a little side note, I'm taking a criminal justice and racism class right now, and we talked about how there's a theory that increased political clout of people of color um, and power for black people in particular leads to increased social control measures. An example of that is arrests and incarceration mm -hmm. and like active verbal and um, societal suppression of that group of people. And I think that was like, it just tied in so well. It was a perfect example of that. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention on this, sorry. Um, another quote is that many Tea Partiers are deeply concerned that they themselves are no longer represented by US government, which I just want to acknowledge that like, that's a blow your mind moment reading that because think it, like about how all women and how people of color have felt and their lack of representation in our government. And so I just wanted to acknowledge <laughs> that part. Um, what are your thoughts, Nikita? Yeah, I think like um, right now we have um, a lot of avenues to which we get to know this racist rhetoric, like it reaches us quicker than what it used to during that time. But it's, um, it's, sad and deeply disturbing to know that this has been going on since lots and lots of years. It's just that now it reaches us quickly. Now it reaches us through a tweet or, you know, uh, but this has been, this has been going on since a long, long time. And it's like, uh, we kind of see the same rhetoric, just a little bit uh, using today's language. And that was the part where I was like, um, it's deep seated and it needs, um, I mean, a lot of people of color, a lot of uh, um, people are uh, in the positions of power are trying to kind of change this 
uh, whole um, rhetoric, but it's uh, it's still there, and that was uh, really disturbing to read. But um, yeah, I mean, I kind of saw the these like themes which started from part one going into part two. Uh, the same fear mongering, the same alarmist language to kind of move public opinion. And it continued on. Uh, and like the uh, whole the euthanasia thing that was a different uh, thing which was going on, but they kind of uh, pushed it into euthanasia and like that side, that whole thing we also saw in part one. Um, and yeah, I mean, this this constant tug of war between um, liberals and uh, conservators where like socialized, uh, socialized medicine versus like whatever um, the conservators want was also the same thing that we saw in part one. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, we'll move on to the more positive um, themes and how that kind of was overcome and still uh, we get a big healthcare reform um, passed and become a law. So yeah. Ooh, you want me to take it away again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it passed, right? That's That's the best thing about this chapter. So it passed because for more than a decade, um, advocates and party leaders have been preparing for this reform. And even when Obama was just running, they were preparing actual like language to go into this bill um, just in case that it happened. It also passed because of the determination and the perseverance of Obama and Reid in the Senate and Pelosi in the House. Yep. Um, it also passed because of the urgency of change that needed to happen, right? Like American healthcare was in really bad shape and some argue that it's still in bad shape um, and people were suffering. And then finally it passed because they had enough votes with three to spare. Um, but the theme of perseverance is something that we both noted when we were reading this, um, starting right from the beginning. So there was an economic collapse in 2008 um, right when this whole thing was like the ball was starting to roll. And so a lot of Obama's advisors um, were like, mm -mm, we're not doing healthcare anymore. We have to focus on this. And what I thought was interesting was that it was mostly um, team members who had a political background. So Vice President Biden, um, Chief of Staff Rahm, and um, political advisor Axelrod. However, those who were like, no, we need to keep this going. It's an important issue. And ultimately it is actually really involved in, you know, bolstering the economy again, was Dashiell, who was eventually replaced, um, as well as Lambrew, who was his healthcare advisor, and Orzak, who was a healthcare economist. So they were the ones that were like, no, like, <laughs> we can do this. <laughs> Don't drop this healthcare goal. We can, we can do this. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I like the way that President Obama kind of stuck to it. He's like, no, I want to go ahead with uh, he healthcare reform, even though like um, 2008 was, as we all know, uh, recession and everything, economic collapse. And um, I was like, I don't know if he's gonna do it. Like, but um, I had the hope that and obviously we knew that it was passed, but um, I just wanted to see how that that went about. Um, yeah, and have this like really uh, great uh, um, quote kind of stuff that I liked. Uh, it was from again Lambrou about the fact that, and it was about universal coverage. So universal coverage keeps coming up as like you lose through the book and kind of that pass still there in the minds of a lot of political uh, politicians. However, again, there's this uh, bipartisanship to which kind of compromise has been uh, met. However, there was a quote about um, universal coverage and she said that the goal of universal coverage was more important than its form. 
So this is a really powerful quote that I felt like thinking about the goal, like what is the end goal and how it's going to help people is more important than the nitty gritties of it and like, oh, uh, I'm a conservator. I don't like this clause in it. I don't like that clause in it. But looking at the big picture and what it's going to do for our people. So I loved that quote from her. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, there was, uh, I, I would call this like part two as the uh, part about the art of negotiation and determination and like the three um, kind of, there were a lot of champions. However, the three that stand out is um, Nancy Pelosi, Reed and um, President Obama. But however, there were a lot of people that uh, kind of um, helped to some people who had um, more interest in universal coverage did kind of at the end went ahead and supported ACA though they felt that ACA fell short on it um, because they realized that okay the end goal is important and how it's gonna help people like it was not all or none and I don't think all or none is ever gonna work um, to get a bill into a law so it has to be kind of bipartisan has to be some sort of um, kind of compromise <laughs> so yeah. yeah I agree I think that's probably the biggest thing that I've learned from reading you know two-thirds of this book so far is how major bipartisan support is in getting a bill passed and one of the things that we were also talking about um, before we started recording um, was that it's personal, right? It's not just like committee, like entire committees going back and forth. It's like individual conversations and negotiations and deals made between, you know, Pelosi and a representative or Reid and the senator yes. or Obama and whoever. And they also um, had to make deals with entire industries, right? The pharmaceutical oh industry, the hospital industry, the insurance industry, and their lobbyists and cutting deals. Um, and most of those were for cost control measures, which was another hugely controversial aspect of this. And probably the main reason why they had such a hard time securing votes is because of, you know, the amount of money that would be dedicated to this. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh the whole uh, lobbying for their own, um, what I would say like their own, their own goal or their own benefit, like the industries, like the insurance industry wanted its own stuff, then the hospital industry wanted, the pharmaceutical industry wanted its own and navigating through all of these things to get a bill passed through both of, the parts and then finally it became a law it was mind-blowing to read that despite all of these hurdles which I unfortunately feel shouldn't have been so many hurdles but there were a lot of hurdles um, finally we had something I'm not saying that it's the best uh, um, reform that we have however um we are kind of inching towards universal coverage and i really hope that we realize it um it's just it would be really um interesting to see how that garners bipartisan support and um eventually we have something that we always dreamed about <laughs> yeah this part was i think really inspiring to, to see like what can actually happen. You have to work really hard. And like you said, jump over a lot of hurdles and make compromises, but. Yeah, I don't remember what, uh, was it about Nancy Pelosi in the book that mentioned about like not sleeping or something and constantly working. I don't remember who it was <laughs> about, but yeah, working hard has its own like, when these things are going on, it has its own uh, 
Yeah. yeah, I remember one of her, one of like the quotes that he, he got was that like at that summit that they held is like, it was like a Hail Mary, like trying to get votes at this like bipartisan summit. Um, they said it was just a tour to like freeze everyone and like keep anyone from like dropping their support. Um, but one of them was like, yeah, Pelosi just like breathed life and gave like yep. such such inspiration and support to people who were like still fighting for this. So yes, I, that was, I remember. You know, I remember like, that line. Yes, I do. Um, yeah, I think it would be really great to finally go and read part three, which is um, from then to now. And I hope you all stay with us to that. We'll be posting um, two questions regarding the um, part two on Goodreads. And I hope you join that discussion. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.